Next, a two-part look at the lingering effects of 9-11 in two Arab nations. First, from Egypt, a report from Margaret Warner. Cairo's Khan al-Halili market has stood for 630 years. Shoppers and sellers jam the streets and alleys. And here, 5,000 miles away from America's shores, the 9-11 attacks still resonate a decade later. No one supports this. We were shocked beyond belief. But there was another sentiment as well. I felt that the American government deserved it. Not the people, but the government deserved it. There was little debate, however, on one point. Like 75 percent of Egyptians in a recent poll, no one here believed that Arabs or Muslims, much less Egyptians, could possibly have been involved. Most Egyptians are Muslims, and Islam does not permit such violence. Some hinted at more powerful forces at work. It wasn't one, uh, uh, only uh, Al-Qaeda doing this. Muslims don't do that. This is an economic conspiracy at its highest level. The 19 hijackers were all Arabs, of course. Their ringleader, Mohammed Atta, grew up in a middle-class Cairo neighborhood. So did Osama bin Laden's top deputy, now running al-Qaeda, Dr. Ayman al-Zawari. Egypt was an incubator of militant political Islam, aiming to overthrow secular governments and replace them with Islamic ones. In the 90s, the movement also drew the U.S., long a supporter of secular Arab regimes, into its sights. We've come to Cairo to explore that history and find out if that ideology still has appeal, even after the Arab Spring. As a young man in the 70s, Zawari was a leader in a new breakaway radical Islamic movement, Egyptian Islamic Jihad. It was banned from taking part in politics. In the early 80s, Zawari and his cohorts turned words into violent action. The radical movement's first really spectacular attack took place here 30 years ago. President Anwar Sadat, while reviewing a military parade, was gunned down. That event, so remote from the daily lives of most Americans at the time, set up a chain reaction that climaxed in the September 11th attacks on the United States. Sadat's successor, the new president, Hosni Mubarak, rounded up hundreds of alleged conspirators and imposed tighter constraints on all of the country's Islamist groups. Among those brought to court in a defendant's cage in 1982, then 31-year-old Zawari. We are Muslims who believe in Zawari railed against Zionism and imperialism and his conditions in prison. They kicked us, they painted us, they whipped us with the electric cable, they shot us with electricity. I met him three times, and he was a very decent, calm, and shy man. Afterward, when I saw his sermon on television, I did not recognize him. He was a different human being, very aggressive. Retired police general Fuad Alam, who helped lead state security's anti-terrorism unit, rejects the theory that the Mubarak regime's torture and repression drove Zawari and other Islamists to greater violence. He was already convinced before his arrest of this concept of takfir, which means anyone who does not subscribe to the same ideology is an infidel and should be attacked and killed. He was not tortured. I can vouch he was not. It would be great if you could present one person who could charge such a thing. These are the marks from being hung by my arms, by my wrists on a sling. They're permanent marks. Abu al Zamur, founder of Egyptian Islamic Jihad, just released after 30 years for his role in Sadat's killing, says both he and Zawari were tortured. I saw it with my own eyes. Even though we were tortured one by one, when they took him, I looked out of a small hole and saw the torture firsthand. What effect did that have on Zawari? This torture did not change our thinking, but it made us believe, though we must endure this pain for the sake of Allah, we will engage in the revenge for such treatment. Columnist and editor Hala Mustafa, who studies Islamist movements, believes Zawari was transformed into a global jihadi figure after he felt forced into exile from Egypt. Because it was very difficult to topple uh, the regime at the time, the militant groups, the Islamic groups in Egypt, 
shifted the focus from uh, from the domestic uh, field to the foreign field from uh, the domestic ruler to the United States which and to the West in in general after prison he joined the fight against the Soviets in Afghanistan teaming up with bin Laden matching his brains to the Saudis charisma since bin Laden's killing, Zawari has been urging his followers to exploit democratic upheavals in the Arab world and to step up attacks on U.S. targets as well. But do these messages still find a receptive audience here? Mohammed Abdul Rahman of the Islamist group Jama Islamiyah says the answer is no. He's camped in front of the U.S. Embassy, petitioning for the release of his father, the so-called blind sheikh, imprisoned in the U.S. for terrorism. Mohammed Rahman says that now that his group can take part in politics, they don't need the tactics Zawahiri still espouses. His message to seize the opportunity in Egypt to revive the spirit of violence does not resonate with the Egyptian people, because they have seen firsthand with the revolution that there is possibility for peaceful change. Yet several nights later, with Sadat conspirator Zumor on stage, one attendee told us U.S. policies abroad still make America a target. After killing a lot of people, innocent people, in Sudan, in Somalia, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and supporting the Jewish state, Israel, so what is the, what, what I'm going to expect out of that? Of course, someone will, you know, will have a, a, a feeling of getting revenge against the Americans. Another unanticipated terror threat may be emerging in Egypt as well, especially in the desert expanse of Sinai, far from Cairo. There, militants returning from exile after Mubarak mingle with local Bedouins in what U.S. officials fear could become a safe haven for terrorists. The last few months have seen attacks on gas pipelines into Israel and a police station. A group calling itself Al-Qaeda in North Sinai claim responsibility. We asked Abu Faisal, a follower of the fundamentalist Salafi strain of Islam, if he'd seen new faces in Sinai since the revolution. I see old and familiar faces of people that had scattered due to the old regime's presence. Now many of the sons of Sinai have returned to their homes from which they were deprived. Salafi leader Assad Admin Kheri Baik said the state's security presence is much diminished since Mubarak fell. When the government left, there was a vacuum that we had to fill. Since the police and court systems are not functional anymore, we've been mediating to maintain the peace by Sharia principles. But Cairo attorney Montasser al-Zayat, jailed with Zawahiri and still representing Islamist groups, says the real threat to the U.S. is not in Sinai. It's in the hearts and minds of a new generation of Egyptians, Islamist and secular alike. Do you think that the conditions that created September 11th, that came out of Egypt at least, are, are worse even now, that they could create another September 11th? There is actually a large chance that this might be repeated because the youth of the Middle East have a lot of anger towards American policy against Iraqis and Afghans and Palestinians. And has the Arab Spring changed any of that? Not at all. Arabs were against their autocratic governments and corrupt leaders, but their resentment towards the U.S. still remains because of its policies. Sawahri's message resonates within this group of youth. To explore that, we went to Zawahri's leafy boyhood neighborhood of Mahdi to meet three Egyptians who were barely teenagers when the towers fell, 23-year-old Ahmed El Sheikh and his friends Sara Mahmoud and Islam Dardiri. What do you remember about the time of those attacks and, and what you thought? I had this mixed feeling about feeling of joy like uh, we, Islamic is taking his revenge from supporting American to Israel and at the same time feeling sorry about this, most, all of these innocent people who have died. They voiced resentment that 9-11 had tarred all Muslims as terrorists. We have to justify, okay, we are not tourists, we are Muslims. We love peace and we do not want to kill you and just we are normal human beings. They all criticized the U.S. response to 9-11 in Afghanistan and Iraq and its support for Arab autocrats like Mubarak who repressed all opponents at home. 
But Islam Dardiri thinks the terrorist threat to the United States has lessened because Egypt's Islamist groups can engage in politics. It will help them to move away from their uh, extreme thinking to more moderate one. Okay, they have to have a solution for every uh, thing. Sarah Mahmoud thinks healing also may come from the Western world's new regard for Egyptians since the February uprising. Actually, the world, the whole world, actually respect us, and they start to open newspaper and look what happened in Egypt today. Americans have to hope that through young Egyptians like these, the U.S. can find a new accommodation with the Arab world. Late tonight, hundreds of protesters converged on the Israeli embassy in Cairo. About 30 of them reached a room on a lower floor and threw documents from windows. In her next report, Margaret looks at the revolutionaries now working to build a new democratic Egypt. 